Good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to this uh, sixth webinar on the, on the AP Moller Maersk decarbonization journey. This is a series of webinars that we host where we try to go a bit deeper in, in, in how we are going to achieve our targets in, in 2040 and in 2030 with regards to decarbonization. And we uh, choose different topics uh, for the webinars, and this time um, the topic is the green fuels, power to X. Um, and, um, and today I have with me here uh, Anders Nordstrøm, who is the COO, so uh, Chief Operating Officer at uh, Ørsted's power to x uh, business. And just a few words on Ørsted for those of you who may not uh, know it. Um, Ørsted is, uh, is the, one of the companies that I actually admire. It's one of what I consider a very, very successful <clears throat> green transition. Ørsted used to have the name uh, Danish Oil and Natural Gas. Uh, so I guess it, <laughs> it almost uh, goes without saying that it had a very different origin than today. Today, Ørsted is uh, largely a renewables developer. Um, a few power plants you're still operating here in, in, in Denmark, but, but uh, Ørsted develops, builds and operates uh, both uh, solar PV, uh, land wind, and, and predominantly offshore wind, actually, where I, I think it's fair to say that you are the world, uh, the world leader. So, um, so warm welcome to Anders, and thank you so much for joining us here. Um, we've talked a lot about partnerships uh, and how um, this whole transition towards the, 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 the Paris Agreement, uh, no one can do that by themselves. And, and, and uh, that's why I'm so happy to have Anders here, because Ørsted is one of the six companies that we signed MOUs with in, in, in March in order to deliver green fuels for our first ships. And, and the deal with Ørsted is actually the largest one of the ones that we have signed. So I think maybe to start us off here, Anders, could you say a few words on, um, on this exciting project that we now have together? Yeah, sure, Morten. And, and thanks for welcoming us and giving the opportunity to participate in the webinar. Um, we, as you, are really strong believers in partnerships in this space of P2X uh, to make it move. Uh, because you, as a, as a large potential consum future consumer of uh, of e-fuels uh, need visibility on your supply, and we as a developer of the production facility need visibility on, on the demand. So, so really a pleasure that this could, uh, this could happen. Um, so the project, the 300,000 tons of methanol production in, in the Gulf Coast of US, um, it's uh, basically what you need uh, is, is uh, renewable hydrogen, uh, it's uh, uh, renewable and sustainable CO2, and then it's combining the two, reacting them into methanol. Um, and if we double click on the, on the hydrogen part, uh, basically it's about splitting water with electricity into uh, hydrogen and oxygen. And you may remember from physics class that if you put electrodes into, into water and apply uh, an electrical potential mm. across the two, then you'll see hydrogen forming at one and oxygen forming at the other electrode. Um, you can actually do it at home in your kitchen you, if, with very simple equipment you, if anyone should be inspired to do yeah, so. <laughs> you can try it at home. Um, but uh, of course, if you want to do this at industrial scale, you'll need much bigger quantities of electricity. So. We believe that we need to develop in the range of 1.2 to 1.5 gigawatts of uh, onshore renewable capacity, uh, solar PV and, and wind, uh, to fuel uh, the electrolyzer that will split the water uh, into the hydrogen and oxygen. And then you could ask, why not just use the hydrogen on the ship uh, as it is? Um, and the, the, the reason for that is that hydrogen is a really bulky um, uh, uh, gas. It's, it's, uh, very difficult to, to compress to, to, uh, to high energy density. Um, so therefore you need to convert it further into a liquid fuel that you can actually bring on board the ship um, with sufficient energy. And, and that's what we do with uh, capturing uh, sustainable CO2 from large point sources um, and uh, then combining it uh, in a process, um, in chemical process to, to, to methanol. Um. Yeah, so it sounds relatively simple, and I guess it's fair to say that all the bits and pieces are, are there. Uh, you don't need to go on and invent a, a whole lot. A lot of innovation in sort of the integration space and so on, but it is all there. So in a way, you know, it's about scaling, industrializing, you know, taking costs down. So 
it, it, I think it, it really makes you think about offshore wind, perhaps where it was, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. And, uh, and again, being, being the world leader in, in that space, is that also how you see it? And, and based on your experience with offshore wind, how do you sort of project this uh, industrialization of power tricks? Yeah, so, so I fully agree that sort of the, all the technologies are there. Really, the challenge is to, to scale them and put them together, uh, especially also running them uh, based on renewables, which is, uh, of course, fluctuating. Um, so, so that's the big challenge. Um, and if you compare to, to where offshore wind was sort of 10, 15 years ago, I think there's, there's quite a lot of similarities. Um, we'd seen the first projects being demonstrated and, and getting to sort of 100 megawatt-ish scale. Um, and it, the technology was working, but uh, there was a, quite a bit of uncertainty on, on scaling further uh, and how to take out cost uh, to, to basically make the technology com uh, competitive against mm -hmm. fossils. Um, and also there was a lot of regulatory uncertainty in many countries uh, on on how you would enable uh, offshore wind uh, to happen. And I think we're seeing quite a bit similar situation in, in, in the P2X space, that we are at the beginning of an industrialization period. Um, but, but there's also some differences. Uh, and, and one of the main ones, I, th I think, is the timing issue. Um, basically, in offshore wind, we, we put the first offshore wind turbines uh, uh, on the sea uh, back in 1991 mm. here in Denmark, in Vinneby. Uh, then it took 10-ish years, uh, basically, to, to get to, to sort of so, some scale uh, in the projects. Then it took another 10 years to, yeah. to industrialize uh, and, and, and get uh, regulatory uh, clarity. Uh, and then uh, it took uh, another five to eight years, basically, to, to get to parity with fossil-generated electricity. Yeah. And, and uh, the last two steps, we need basically not to do in, in 15, 20 years, we need <laughs> to do those in maybe five, 10 years in yeah. this space. Yeah. Um, so luckily, you could say there's basically an unprecedented uh, 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 support from society and, and politicians yes. to really make this happen. Of course, because of the urgency of combating climate change. Um, and maybe even accelerated by, by sort of the energy situation we see right now. Um, so, so we are very sort of uh, confident that it will happen and it will happen fast. Uh, the challenge right now is really to, to take all the ambition, all the political willingness to make things happen, to actually translate that into uh, the regulation uh, and the incentives uh, to, to enable well, your business and our business basically. And, and in that sense, we, we really appreciate your move to, to, to basically take sort of a, a leap of faith that this will happen and, and, uh, and move before the regulation has come in your business uh, through the IMO, for instance. Yeah, it, 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 it's an interesting point, right? This um, this pull that you didn't have in 1991 when you put up the first turbine in Winnipeg. Um, and, and, and we need that, right, because the, the clock is ticking. I certainly hope that uh, the green fuels will follow the cost curve of offshore wind because then it will be <laughs> very cheap in the end. Let's see. But, but the thing is, time, time is running, the clock is ticking, and, and um, the demand will be huge. I mean, if you just look at our, the, the 12 ships or 13 that we have already ordered, it's actually around a half a million tons of, of these fuels. And, and uh, when we look towards 2030, where we have also set a target of actually having 25% of our vessels um, uh, running on green fuels, then uh, a bit depending on how much our fleet will grow by then, um, it'll be something like five to six million tons uh, of something that doesn't exist today. So I guess um, in your strategy in Ørst, uh, it's a very clear uh, that you want to do that sort of forward move in the value chain and make power tricks part of your, of your business, right? So, so how are you thinking about 2030? What are you doing to scale? And do you have any like specific targets? Or how, how do you think about that sort of medium term horizon? <clears throat> we haven't set any specific targets for, for power to x by 2030, simply because it's, it's so <laughs> difficult to predict where we are just in five years um, in, in this space. Um, but what we've said is that we aspire to be a global leader in this space, both in renewable hydrogen and, and green fuels. <laughs> Um, and we've built a pipeline of, of projects, of which uh, 10 are public. Um, 
And, and if, if those materialize towards 2030, uh, then we will have more than three gigawatts of, of mm -hmm. electrolyzer capacity up and running. Um, we've also set a target that we will have at least 50 gigawatts of, of renewables uh, up and running uh, by 2030. Um, and, and just for this project, as mentioned, you know, the 1.2 to 1.4 gigawatts, uh, so 1.5 gigawatts of, of uh, onshore renewables is needed. Um, so, so we are trying to make things happen with projects starting now, uh, including the project with you guys. Um, and then basically scale from there. Uh, and, and within the methanol space, we have two other projects going, uh, yeah. one in Sweden with a company called Liquid Wind, um, and also one here in Denmark called Green Fuels for Denmark, which has sort of gathered um, major off-takers in, mm -hmm. in transport in general, uh, including yourselves, uh, to, to make it happen. Um, so, so that's what we are basically doing mm -hmm. concretely. But I guess uh, also if you just go back a few years, that pipeline of Power to X, I guess, wasn't even there, right? So it's something that has, I mean, so if you, I hope that curve will continue, and uh, I certainly also hope that we will make more uh, projects together, and that this is only the first one. Um, just on, so what the, the project we have together, as you explained, is is uh, is an a synthetic fuel or e-fuel power to X. Um, uh, but but when it comes to methanol, you can also make it from from uh, sustainable biomass, for example, by direct gasification of the biomass. Of course, need to make good care that it is sustainable and so on. Um, but, but, and the way we see that is actually that sort of in the medium short term, that, is <clears throat> that, is, that looks to be the more cost competitive alternative uh, for, for as a fuel. And then, uh, but it does because of you need a, the catchment area for the actual biomass, you have a limitation to how much you can actually scale these facilities. So, <clears throat> so sort of going out in the future. For really methanol to scale, you need e-methanol, and you're using, as you explained, point sources. So you take CO2 from a biogenic source that would have otherwise just gone into the atmosphere. Um, and that's, of course, a, 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 a scarce resource. Um, uh, so at some point in time, we think it's some years out, but at some point in time that we will need to discuss who actually gets that. And some of it will probably have to go into the ground uh, to create negative emissions. So the way we look at it is that if we go, let's say, into the 30s, for methanol really to take off as, as, as a synthetic fuel, we will need direct air capture um, to work. Uh, and that will require some innovation, but, but uh, and then there are of course other fuel sites. But how, sort of from your end of, you are kind of sitting at the other end of the value chain. So uh, do you agree to that analysis or, or, or what have your experience been from, from now having been in this market for some years? Yeah, I think, I think the, the natural thing for us as a renewables mm -hmm. company is that we uh, focus on the e-methanol. Um, we, we acknowledge that, that biomethanol is, is out there and probably right now uh, where e-methanol is it's in its infancy, uh, biomethanol is cheaper. We see a bigger scale, a better scalability of, of e-methanol and probably also a, a, an easier cost out cur uh, curve. Um, and then on the direct air capture, I think a lot of innovation is, 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 is happening uh, and, and hope that's basically sort of the holy grail of, of the green transition. If we can capture CO2 out of the air and either store it or use it. Uh, so so uh, let's, let's hope for that. But that's, that's very early days uh, for, for and, and lab scale uh, experimenting. Um, but there's also other fuels like e-ammonia, for instance, uh, which we believe will, will pick up towards the end of this decade. Um, a, a, a also as a shipping fuel, uh, of course, there's, there's challenges on, on, on the engine and the bunkering uh, methodologies, etc., for, 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 for e-ammonia. But in principle, there, you, to, to produce e-ammonia, you need uh, hydrogen again uh, as the energy carrier, and then you need nitrogen from air. And 78% and of the air we breathe is, is nitrogen, so, so that you could actually do in many places. Mm. Uh, so, so we do see uh, that there's a lot of scalable potential here. Um, and, and right now, we are, the, we are sort of engaged in, in the e-methanol space and, and closely following the e-ammonia space. Yeah. But for now, we will go with the point sources. We will go uh, with e-methanol uh, as Ørsted is producing for us. And um, I think this is a great example of a partnership where really, you know, the both ends of the value chain comes together to solve the, the chicken and egg uh, problem here. So we are really happy about the partnership. 
and um, and we look forward to hopefully many more in in the years to come. So you can go above the three gigawatts in in 2030. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Morten, for inviting, and and we really appreciate uh, the project we have together. And and really, we need to move this forward. Uh, it, it's necessary. There's there's a urgency, uh, yeah. and and therefore we need to scale and and get going. Yes. So thanks very much for today. Thank you and. Thank you very much for, for watching here today. I hope this gave you a little bit of a glimpse into the engine room of uh, what it actually takes to accelerate the green transition and address the climate crisis that we are in. Uh, we are doing what we can. We are doing it together in a partnership and uh, we look forward to taking that forward. So thank you everyone and have a great day.